Good evening, everyone. Time for another Bitcoin report. With the news about the NSA and Edward Snowden and a lot of questions swirling about, especially about this subject of cryptography and spying, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into that and maybe do kind of a basic explanation for people who don't really understand this stuff. I'm not an expert at all. Hopefully I can make it more understandable. So let's start off with Jeffrey Tucker's story. When NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden wanted to talk to reporter Glenn Greenwald, he insisted that they use encrypted chat. Unfortunately, Greenwald didn't know how to go about setting that up. In fact, he needed a tutorial in how to do it. Indeed, many people do. I was looking at the download figures of various encryption programs and they are not impressive about 52,000 for one popular program. Apparently this approach to securing conversations is far from mainstream. Why should anyone bother? Encrypted chat is like the cone of silence in the Get Smart series, except that it actually works. It makes conversations impossible for outsiders to listen to. So far as snoops are concerned, the conversation might as well have not happened. How can we be sure? The best case is precisely that Snowden trusted it. He knew exactly what the NSA could surveil and what was invisible. He knew that this level of encryption was NSA proof. Otherwise, he would not have taken the risk. Why would anyone but a whistleblower need it? Let's say you want to talk about a business deal with a remote party, and it's extremely important that there be no security breaches. You would be crazy to use email, but even chat is a mistake. One party has a full record of it, even aside from all issues of surveillance. You don't have to be breaking the law to use this technology. It might be useful for talking about health records or household finances or some issue that might be embarrassing to have on record or dragged up and put in your face later. Now, with the HIPAA requirements for medical records and for banking regulations, that's actually the two that it is already required that encryption be used. So you're already doing that. Um, continuing. The most common encryption standard today, pretty good privacy, was created by Phil Zimmerman in 1991. As an anti-nuclear peace activist, he wanted to make it possible for people to communicate with each other, even in totalitarian countries, but prohibited speech. To his amazement, it was the U.S. government that tried to stop the code from being released. In 1993, he was prosecuted for illegal export of munitions. Go figure. A huge protest ensued. The code swirled around the internet like a crazy global storm, a clear sign that the internet cannot be stopped from distributing information. Even more strikingly, MIT Press published the entire code in a book that actually sold rather well that was protected under the First Amendment. In time, the government backed down. It was a great victory for technological progress and the freedom of speech. In other words, if the government had its way, we might not have this type of encryption at all. And I'm going to show you that it's a little bit different than you think about that. But we do have it thanks to a series of simultaneous discoveries of the logic of public key cryptography in the 1970s. From Wikipedia, I'm amazed to learn that William Stanley Jevons, economist in the late 19th century marginal revolution in economics, actually anticipated the logic of public key cryptography. PGP is not the only one. There is OTR messaging as well. Both go far beyond the encryption used in most web commerce, SSL, which only masks the communications between your computer and a company's servers, but such companies still maintain the data. The technology has been around for a long time, but users have mostly not bothered. That could change in the light of all the news about government snooping. For some communications in the future, people might be willing to give up some convenience of commercial programs for the security of encrypted communications. By the way, here is an obvious and quick answer to the NSA's claim that it must harvest as much data as possible as a way to stop terrorism and protect the American way of life from dangerous criminals. If you're a dangerous criminal or terrorist plotting an attack and you're not entirely stupid, it is very likely that you would choose cryptographic communications over commercial services. Hence, the very communications that the NSA supposedly seeks are the ones that it cannot get. 
What then is the point behind the huge data centers and invasions on everyone else's liberty? The purpose is to control the rest of us and to shore up its power. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to accept that truth. You need only have your eyes open. So it goes on, a very interesting article by Jeffrey Tucker today. And I wanted to delve a little bit deeper into this issue. This is a quote that's on my blog, a quote from J. Orland Grab. J. Orland Grab is uh, deceased now, but he is the very, very famous author of uh, books that are still used today, MBA course, uh, MBA level courses on derivatives. Uh, but he wrote uh, the stunning piece in 1995 called The End of Ordinary Money. Uh, you can find, uh, here's a library of privacy and cryptology articles by J. Orland Grab. So let's read a little bit of The End of Ordinary Money. And we'll see that uh, the origin of some of this is not exactly what we would believe. Late one night while sharing a pharmacological product with a spook I met in the northeastern part of the United States, I mentioned I was studying cryptology. Cryptology is the future, he responded emphatically. It's what is going to protect us from Big Brother. Since he worked for the NSA, the thought did occur to me that many would have taken the position that he and his colleagues were Big Brother. But I had learned years ago not to demonize people on the basis of an accidental profession. After all, if an ex-CIA employee like Kerry Thornley could become a staunch libertarian, the creator of Xenarchy and implied co-author of the Aresian holy book Principia Discordia, then there was hope for all of us. I additionally believed that one of our best defenses against the national security state was the perennial proclivity of clandestine organizations to piss off their own employees. At any rate, the spook spoke the truth. Cryptology represents the future of privacy and more. By implication, cryptology also represents the future of money. So he saw the Bitcoin back in 1995 and the future of bank banking and finance. By money, I mean the medium of exchange, the institutional mechanisms for making transactions, whether by cash, check, debit card, or other electronic transfer. Given the choice between intersecting with a monetary system that leaves a detailed electronic trail of all one's financial activities and a parallel system that ensures anonymity and privacy, people will opt for the latter. Moreover, they will demand the latter because the current monetary system is being turned into the principal instrument of surveillance and control by tyrannical elements in Western governments. That's what we're seeing coming out right now. These elements all want to know where your money comes from and when and how you spend it. After all, you might be a terrorist, drug dealer, or spy. And if you try to hide your transactions, you are by definition a money launderer and perhaps a child pornographer. Say what? To understand this quaint accus accusatorial juxtaposition, one only has to grasp a few simple facts. Money is digital information. The way to hide digital information is through cryptography. The government doesn't want you using cryptography because they want to know where your money is so they can get some of it. And they don't like you using drugs unless the government is the dealer or viewing child pornography unless the government supplies it because it's setting you up for a blackmail or smear campaign. Okay, I'll admit it, I like privacy. I often send mail inside sealed envelopes and sometimes close the door when I go to the bathroom, take drugs, nothing like a cup of espresso in the morning, and don't like to pay taxes. But doesn't H&R Block make a living off this same popular sentiment? I don't know much about child pornography, etc., so I'm not going to go into that. But it's uh, very, very long and detailed, goes into the war on drugs, goes into the SWIFT system, goes into cryptography, the NSA, and uh, it's an unbelievable article, again, written in 1995 by J. Orland Grab. So, clearly a visionary, and his source was someone in the NSA. So, the Snowden stuff goes way back. 
Now, I wanted to jump over to a story that hit recently. This is a new story about the IRS. This one kind of was under the radar. IRS buying spying equipment, covert cameras in coffee trays and plants. So one would immediately ask if the NSA is able to listen into everything, and I'm assuming that these agencies work together, although that may be a poor assumption. If that's the case, then why would they have to start buying bugs? And of course, the reason why is because of encryption, because even though the news is that they're listening to everything, actually their ability to listen to everything is decreasing every day. And that goes back to the hash, the encrypted hash. SHA-2, this is a second generation, I'm going to read a little bit of this. SHA-2 is a set of cryptographic hash functions and it includes uh, 224, 256. Now SHA-256 is actually the hash function used in the Bitcoin. Designed by the US National Security Agency and published in 2001 by the NIST as the US Federal Information Processing Standard. A hash function is an algorithm that transforms hashes, an arbitrary set of data elements such as a text file, into a single fixed length value, the hash. The computed hash value may then be used to verify the integrity of copies of the original data without providing any means to derive said original data. This irreversibility means that a hash value may be freely distributed or stored as it is used for comparative purposes only. SHA stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. SHA-2 includes a significant number of changes from its predecessor, SHA-1. SHA-2 consists of a set of four hash functions, etc. In 2005, security flaws were identified in SHA-1 namely that a mathematical weakness might exist, indicating that a stronger hash function would be desirable. Although SHA-2 bears some similarity to the SHA-1 algorithm, these attacks have not been successfully extended to SHA-2. So SHA-2, uh, or the SHA-256, which is behind the Bitcoin, has never been successfully uh, attacked. Now, Again, there may need to be another course. The main point is that there's always the ability to create longer and more complex hashes. So I wanted to take you just to something simple to explain to you how the mathematics of this functions. And uh, we'll go to one of my videos that I have on my other channel just to show you this YouTube address. If you look up at the top, you've got this YouTube address of a series of letters and numbers. You can see it's a series of capital letters, lowercase letters and numbers, and there's actually, I think, a couple dashes that they use. So if you think about 26 letters in the alphabet times two is 52, and then you've got 10 numbers and you've got a couple other characters in there. So we'll just go with the numbers 64 unique characters in there. You can see if I take that address and I search for it, it is unique. There's just the number of hits coming up from Google, my original video, and then the other websites and links that connect to that. So that is a, a unique address, and you can see that this is an 11 character. It's 11 characters in length. So let's look at that to get an idea of how big that number is. So just on a simple calculator, we can calculate that out to 11 places. If we just do 64 times 64 to get our two characters, there's 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So if we go out 11 places, you can see uh, that we're out to 294 billion, trillion, quadrillion, uh, so we're 73 quintillion is the number of unique addresses that can be generated with 11 characters uh, with that method. So if we divided that by, say, the population of the world, which is 7 billion, we come up with 
10 billion 540 million videos possible that every person on earth could make so that's obviously more videos than any person could make in their lifetime and that's times the entire population of the earth so it doesn't look like YouTube is going to run out anytime soon in those addresses but let's look at the SHA hash function actually we're going to use the SHA1 and uh, what you can do here this is just a hash function calculation site where you can calculate a hash and I will show you for example very common password is just the word password so we'll just use that and calculate the hash and you can see down below the original text is password and here are the bytes uh, here's these other simpler ones and uh, we've got MD2, 4, and 5. MD5 is a very common one now. Then there's a ripe series. Here's SHA-1 and you can see SHA-256, SHA-384, and there's SHA-512. So there's obviously further to go if it's needed. But let's just take the SHA-1 and we have another site here that is a reverse hash calculator and you can see that they only allow you to calculate um, SHA-1 or MD5 so you have to enter an MD5 or SHA-1 hash we'll put that hash in this box and click submit basically it's uh, doing something similar to what you do when you try to solve the Bitcoin and you can see now with the computing power that we have and using SHA-1 it solved that and it found out that it is password so obviously as the computing power grows the ability to solve these grows but then again uh, the people who are creating the uh, hashes and the encryption are always light years ahead of the people trying to break them because it takes so much more computational power to break them as opposed to create them so that's why cryptography is such a big deal I believe that's why we're seeing it in the news today and uh, it's not what it appears to be uh, actually it may turn out that the NSA are the good guys um, at least certain groups of people in the NSA certainly perhaps the gentleman that J. Erling Grab spoke to who believed that cryptography is what is going to protect us from Big Brother we also know that the SHA-256 function which is the key uh, hash used by the Bitcoin was designed by the NSA so uh, very interesting types of things and we'll just have to wait and see how this whole thing shakes out and we'll talk to you next time.